risking ourselves and our status to dismantle systems of oppression is the core of the practice of authentic allyship. Allyship is needed because systems of oppression exist. The work of allyship is powered by a vision that we don't have to live this way and hope that another way can be realized in the real world. Systems of oppression rely on people with higher perceived status to maintain and enforce them. The best chance to change the caste system is when people on many levels of the system actively work to change it, when following the lead of those most impacted by it. I want to share some of the risks that I have experienced in my work as an authentic ally. I share this knowing that others have risked more, but I need to say that it's not a competition. Competition is a hook systems of oppression use to keep us divided. If we simply move from one ranking system to another, say from a ranking system based on skin color and economic status, to how much we've risked, we've really gained nothing but a propensity for competitive self-harm. As a white male cisgender Christian pastor, I have a lot of status in the caste system. I experience this when I walk into a store, into a community meeting, or talk to a politician. I often get a slight nod of respect that is denied to others. Most of this is not because of what I've done or what I know. In reality, it's because people in my role are expected to support the system. As a pastor, I'm expected to support the idea that the current caste system is the will of God and that our problems are just that we're not nice enough. For me, love is the willingness to risk so that oneself and others may be truer to themselves. Love, as such, is not a feeling, but an activity. This activity generates feelings, but is not limited to them. When I saw Muslims being targeted by well-funded hate groups, I felt a very strong call to the work of authentic allyship. I checked out that call with my family, the bishops of both the Lutheran and Episcopal churches, friends, many fellow pastors and deacons, and they helped me to discern a next step. A lot has changed for me since I've been engaged in allyship with my Muslim sisters and brothers, but I only took one step at a time. First is verbal criticism. People have called me a traitor to the United States. Many have said that I am unfaithful to Jesus and will burn in hell forever. Many have said that I will be held accountable by God for leading people astray instead of converting Muslims. People have told me that I am a Neville Chamberlain naively going along with a well-intentioned stupidity. I've also been verbally scolded by people who feel that I'm not woke enough. One man said that I did not call out racism harshly enough in a speech. But I spent the speech talking about nothing but racism, but mostly describing it in other terms or talking about my own. We have learned that calling people racist is not an effective tool at persuading people. A young white woman told me that I was being too soft in a congregation with regard to racism, and she was very angry with me. Only after a long conversation could I help her understand that my strategies were aimed at persuadable people, not staking out a stance that claims purity. We need to keep our long-term goals in mind but also recognize that people can only move as far as they can move today. I've experienced physical risk. I've been struck. I was targeted by a car and had my foot run over. Luckily, I was not injured. I have felt endangered through physical intimidation, threatening messages, and looks of rage. I've had to take measures to make my home address harder to find on the internet. I notice who is around me after a public speech and follow my Muslim partners to their cars. I don't leave until they are on their way safely. I have lost a sense of safety. Relationships with family. Family members were uncomfortable with my choices. One told me that I was going to get myself shot as we were playing pool one day. 
I told him that if I got shot, it would not be because I went to the gun store and bought a gun and bullets. Don't put other people's actions on me, I said. Another family member told me that I was supporting the equivalent of rabid dogs that would destroy our nation. That family member has since met my partners and has changed his mind a bit. I am fortunate that we have managed to maintain our relationships and keep them intact. But it was a close thing. I've experienced some financial risk. I now have a stable income, but for a number of years it was not so. I found it easier to create full-time work more than a full-time salary. We had to make adjustments around the house. But we had a house and health insurance through my spouse's work. But for a kid that grew up poor and who mowed lawns starting in second grade and worked on a farm starting in fifth grade, it was strange not to know where support would come from. Can you see my privilege in this? I've experienced some professional risk. Many pastors and community members and our churches support my work. Our, our bishops have risked themselves to do that too. And for all of that, I am deeply grateful. When I went to my home church, I got a different reception, however. When I told them what I was doing and why, about half of them could not look at me. Some told me that they have bought more guns to protect themselves from my friends. Some pastors have told me that I'm a drama king, that I'm exaggerating the danger to our society and to Muslims because of anti-Muslim hate groups. Some pastors have let me know that they think I've lost my mind. When I speak at churches, I often have three white men take me aside and tell me that I'm a naive fool. I tell them that I may, they may be right, that I may be naive. But I also say that there are three kinds of naivete. The naivete of danger, the naivete of fear, and the naivete of passivity. Of the three, as a Christian, I would follow Jesus' lead and embrace the consequences of the first rather than the other two. But of course, once I leave a public venue, I can take off my collar and go to the store for something to drink. Nobody knows I've betrayed the caste system. My Muslim partners, people of color who choose to wear traditional clothing of Islam, don't have the same experience. Risk of complicated and ambiguous work is a part of authentic allyship. I have lost a lot of sleep in this work. I have made many mistakes in conversations and in public settings and in the media sometimes. I am often confronted with my own racism and religionism and how much white Christian supremacy has been woven into my perspectives, behaviors, and theology. This work is never perfect, and it is often painful. And I want to be clear. All that I have experienced is nothing compared to what people of color and or people of minority wisdom traditions experience. Absolutely nothing. I preached and taught at a church one Sunday. In the Q&A portion, a person proudly said, I've never felt that way about Muslims. My response was this. Well, that's great. But that's not the issue. The issue is this. Are you willing to risk yourself and your status to support your Muslim neighbors? That provoked a very different conversation. Once in a coffee shop, an atheist told me that if everyone was atheist, we would not have these problems. I said to him, our philosophy or religious tradition are not the most important thing. The important question is this. Are we willing to risk ourselves to love our neighbors? So, what are you willing to risk to dismantle systems of oppression? It's important to consider that question. But remember, it all comes one step at a time. You don't need to do more than you can do on any one day. Because of my position in the caste system, as a Christian white male pastor, I can work more effectively on some of the pillars of the caste system than others. 
I intentionally maintained my participation and membership in both the Lutheran and Episcopal churches. This caused some pain for the bishops of both churches. There were resignations from those churches because of my work. But it meant that the bishops and the larger churches they have care of were putting their institutional support and financial support behind my work. They increased the impact of my work and thus did the work of authentic allyship themselves. But I also want to say one last thing. I have found the blessings to far outweigh the costs. Many of the costs have given me a sense of compassion for those that never experienced the benefits of our caste system. Many of the costs have given me a sense of freedom, realizing that I don't have to do what the caste system tells me to do. I don't need what the caste system offers. Instead, I have found myself more able to accept myself and others for who they are and for who I am. I have found my humanity because I've engaged and supported the humanity of others. This is, in the words of the Christian tradition, a pearl of great price. It is greater than any price we might pay. So as you consider what, how you are going to be an authentic ally and how you might risk yourself, remember that in addition to the risks, there'll be many benefits and blessings.